Well, of course, there's two points that that raises. One is, when I was working with Ray Charles, it wouldn't have even occurred to me to say, what you're doing is not Ray Charles, because you're Ray Charles. Why would I say that to you? I mean, it's just insane. And what what my job was, was to, because I was lucky enough to co-write four songs that he recorded. My job was, he said, I'm not writing songs anymore. I rely on people to write songs for me. So I, I went into it, uh, me and Phil Spaulding, we went into it to, to write songs that would be songs that he would have written when he was starting out, that expressed the, that feeling that made him write songs. So we did, and, and he said, you know, man, that's so great, because this is all the kinds of stuff that I would have thought about. But by that, doing that, it's what you talk about with you know quantum physics it's getting into the artist at the quantum level you have to know them really really well and and think about what what their inspiration was and their thoughts were and get into them so much that you're going to join them in a beautiful collaboration and i'm sure that's what you've done with most of the people who you've produced so therefore, you probably, you know, do that same kind of, I mean, I do a lot of research. That's, that's what I do, you know, and that's, that's what I enjoy because otherwise, who are you working with? You're working with somebody. And, uh, and so that's, that's one point that it raises. And the other point that it raises about that lick being, you could see why Chuck Berry, one thing I've noticed about uh, classic artists that I've worked with, they know themselves really well. <laughs> and, and an eighth note, it is a world, it is a universe. You don't even know what's wrong, and they know what's wrong immediately, really quickly. Yes. None of this is uh, any kind of critique of of Keith Keith Richards or uh, Chuck Berry, but no. the but the but it is a critique of what what can happen when the essence of music, either microscopic or, or indeed it, it can become then, you know, a combinatorial explosion uh, where, where suddenly nothing's good. Nothing's yeah. good about this. There are two points here, two, two quick points. One is the idea that success oh, justifies God. everything. It doesn't. Mm -hmm. Sure. You know, success justifies money. And yeah, there is a really good point to be made that if somebody has been successful 20 times, then whatever they say will make us money again. So that's cool. But now that the whole other world and the other world is called art. In terms of art, that success level with the public is not relevant. And maybe that world isn't relevant to those people, but it's relevant to us because unfortunately we're artists. And so then we have to, we have to commit to that. So as artists, we have a different frame of reference to other people necessarily. Now, another artist, for instance, Chuck Berry's frame of reference was a different frame of reference to Keith Richards frame of reference. And so, Keith Richards didn't notice that because it, it wasn't in his frame of reference. And equally, when, when somebody says he overwrites about me, for whom? He writes too many notes for me. I'll accept that, that criticism right away. No problem, because that's a subjective uh, thing. But he overwrites. They always make it as if it's objective, and it isn't. It can't be. So, so that's, you know, it's silly. What I love about your career and my career is that it's been a collaboration with producers, with artists. It's, it's something we're doing together. You have to both be doing it together. It's like playing tennis, but only one person bothers to hit the ball back. Sure, you can't um, do that. Well, uh, uh, all of me, why not take all of me? Can't you see? Um, what is the point of getting me in for just the last two weeks of my memory of whoever it was that made it uh, into the American top ten? 
Um, uh, of course, I'm going to take. Uh, I'm going to take. That's Phoebe. I'm going to take notice of these things. And um, uh, music is one way or another a very trite statement, but uh, some kind of uh, um, a response to your life and times. I mean, it can't. Sure. You know, I'm not dragging weather report yeah. about with me all the time. No. Uh, uh, but 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 the but they're in my, my heart. I, um, Neil Wilkinson told me. Uh, uh, oh, I hope Neil can I. Neil Wilkinson told sure. me a great story. Sure. I hope he doesn't mind. I won't m uh, mention any names beyond this. There was a there was a band that was in my production studio in Battersea um, called Sphere, which is now in LA. In my production room, there was a the band that had been signed to the you know the the, the you know this mythological million pound deal. And this would be probably about 10 years ago, I expect. They were in the studio and they were a bit punky, I seem to remember. And I remember the main studio door opened and, and I was in my room. My room door was open and I could hear them, you know, playing, you know, cymbal, bass, drum. And of yeah. course, the record company does all the usual thing, which is there's some grey hair guy that knows how to plug in a compressor. compressor. So he's going to get it to sound good. But, you know, one way or another, he's going to be great. Uh, it'll sound great, but the stuff, well, depends on, this is subjective, but the stuff was sound, was the actual substance of it, as opposed to how it sounded, you know, my research proposal uh, was yeah. uh, not, not great, I didn't think. Anyway, so in the meantime, Neil Wilkinson had been in there doing um, also on one of the, the session beforehand. He was in there playing for the X Factor, doing the X Factor band uh, with Nigel Wright at the helm. Yep. And uh, Neil goes in and either plays a chart or, they're, you know, they're going, um, heard it through the grapevine, you know, two, three, four, go. Yeah, of course. Um you know, you, you either you can look at a chord chart or a drum chart. It doesn't really matter. You're going to get through that. You know, even if the roof collapses. Exactly. And um, so, so Neil was doing this, but the guy in this band had heard Neil heard Neil playing this thing, and came because Neil told me this later when he came into my studio, and he, he and uh, so the guy came up to Neil and said, "Do you, when you're playing that, do you read music?" And um, uh, Neil was saying, yeah, yeah, but, I, you know, a lot of the time, you know, I, I just I just use it as an aid memoir, you know, because I know the song, it's part of my being sort of thing. Right. And um, so, but yeah, I read music and the guy goes, see, I don't play like that because I play from the heart. And, and I'm sure you've been through, so... Well, can I, well, can well, I just well, say a word? I need to say this word again because I've already said it in this in this uh, podcast, but I'm going to say it again. Horse crap, horse crap, and um, probably back in the mid to late eighties. And I'm trying to play something, you know. I'm working on say Frankie goes to Hollywood. Or started hearing this th this word. It's a, a diminutive of musician. It's muso. Yes, that's all about muso. Yes, I've heard that one many times. Uh, Muso, and, and I thought about it, you know, and the one thing that the musicians, I think, you know, and it's a very noble thing, this, at no point have I, have I ever accused an engineer of being an angel, you know, no. for, if, for, for taking three hours to set up a sound and getting the, a chain of compressors and EQs and so All on. Oh, an angel. It's, uh, it, it, so, uh, it, you, you know, God's sake, stop being an angel. Now, yeah. You, um, Richard, when you and I worked, remember we worked briefly with Paul McCartney and... Um, yes. I was drafted in to produce 16 tracks which had been unfinished and he asked me what each track needed and on a couple of them I said, what this track needs is Peter John Vitesse to come in here and be Scottish all over these tracks. Yes, well, I didn't know I was being Scottish, of course. Yeah. And, um, uh, but um, so I, I, maybe sometime after that, I went to work with Phil Ramon, and um, Phil was extraordinary. He told me he told me something about that I didn't know. Phil engineered uh, Miles Davis for some early Miles Davis sessions. Sure. But the but the obviously the hierarchy was quite different. But it was still made an impression on Phil because when I was working with Phil Ramon, it was in Guillaume Tell in Paris. And Phil went off his nut when uh, the engineer would be taking too much time, you know, getting a sound. 
um, or that if the engineer went round behind them inexplicably um, um, to, to to do something. And Phil gave gave this engineer a terrible dressing down uh, about don't do that. These these are the musicians. They you know they're they're making the racket. Blah blah blah. And um, what's one of the things that I think that did change, Richard, if you're asking me, and it's, it's not a criticism, it's just the way of things, is that oftentimes it's, things have moved from, I think largely from musician producer to engineer producer. And um, that, ha that happened a long time ago, uh, of course. And of course, there are really good engineer producer, uh, not uh, astonishingly great engineer producers. Yeah. They've managed to convince musicians that the good is bad and the bad is good. Right, right. Somehow, uh, uh, you know, because, because the thing that you do, the thing that you have to have is have it sound good. Nobody's going to, uh, you know, nobody's going to complain about that, would they? Yes, I want to sound the best I can, but it's usually against some kind of normative, you know, what is good. Now, I don't know if you saw, it was a film, but before it was a film, it was a great book. It was called uh, The Men Who Stared at Goats. Yes, love it. Love it. And it was about psychological operations, uh, you know, and uh, Majestic 12, um, it was made into a black comedy and uh, George Clooney and so on as the film. It's, a good, it's still a good film, but the book is serious. Um, and it happened, which is that the, they started to do these psychological operations where they, they began to understand that you could disrupt, for instance, um, thought by sub bass, uh, by sub E frequencies. You could also coerce um, a confession out of somebody by repetition of particularly pieces of music, something like, you know, I'm not, I'm just plucking it out there, I should be so lucky. Uh, you can, you know, you just keep playing that, you know, under these circumstances loud and again and again and again and again, and then sub frequencies to disrupt thought. You ring a confession out of, you know, somebody that's been captured, well, sure. or whatever it would be. Sure. Um, and I just thought, oh, wow. Is that what we did to ourselves? Mm -hmm. I was in the middle of uh, a, a little local village and there was um, a, an old BMW, it doesn't matter, but it had some subwoofers that were un spectacularly brilliant. I mean, they were, they were, they were uh, rattling the ground. Um, and I was just thinking, that's probably disrupting the occupant of that car's thoughts. And the, then I thought about this thing about two bar looping, you know, we, we talk about it now, it's two bars. When I do these um, uh, uh, talent shows and I get the, you know, asked to do, you know, backing tracks and stuff like that, I'm very happy to do it. But I usually ask, can I just do the music, the ones that involve music? Uh, so I, I quite like doing 70s, 60s or 70s things because I have to listen yeah. to the harmony and, sure. you know. It's, it's fun to do, um, but but the last few I got there were that I got four to do. Uh, three of them were the same chord sequence. Um, uh, you know the ones the Anatole. one six four five is usual. Yeah, 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 yeah Anatol and um, and in the same in the same order. And the other one was the same uh, chords in a different order. Um, and the the there was one in I won't mention names. There was one in particular huge hit um, that I made analysis of it in order to try and, you know, understand both the methodology and the outcomes of the methodology. And I, I was listening to uh, carefully about, no, wait a minute, that's looped. That that piano figure has been looped. I could, I could tell it had been looped. Sure. So uh, I, I played the first, uh, I played the first seven seconds of it and then it got looped, which meant that uh, I'd done, I'd done all of the track because it's not in real time, uh, you know, Apple D, 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 finished. I'd done the whole track essentially in less than a minute. Um, and it was repetition of exactly the same thing over and over and over again. Jeremy Lubbock said something else that I didn't, I, I, well, I didn't, it's not that I disagreed with him. Here's, here's another way of thinking of this. Remember when he said to you uh, about um, when he uh, foisted his album, on whoever it was, and they said it's uh, the there was a critique of it that says it's like elevator music. 
and um, I, and I was thinking, but do you remember what the original purpose of elevator music was for? It was to take your mind to escape the awful reality of how long it was taking for this elevator to get from one <clears throat> to the next. That's a nice way to think about it, Pete. Uh, and and um, for me, the, the, whole, the whole project, if you call it a project of musical endeavor, is is that idea that teleologically you, one hopes that, that it's a form of, for the listener, that you can escape, at least put some kind of awful reality behind you. Yes, but, but I mean, and that's a beautifully nice way to think about a terrible statement made, which is was meant to be disparaging, just as the word muso is meant to be disparaging. I mean, this is the great thing. They, they, they choose to criticize you for being what you are, which is a musician. So what have they hired you for? The, mm -hmm. the question comes in. So, so you know, this is part of this double, double think, double speak that that we're all. Uh, and you know, po po politics today, which I don't want to get into, but we're talking about the same thing: the use of double speak to to change people's minds and to d divert people's attention away from from certain facts of what you know, the plutocracy or oligarchy are doing and and uh, use certain other things to fool people who are being exploited into thinking that they are being exploited by somebody else. So it's, you know, it's all part of the same thing. And uh, uh, it's very interesting the way that you, you talk about it because it, it relates to everything in our existence the way actually music does. You know, people think music is just a, connection of notes, but there's so much, uh, if you were a scientist, or, or which you are, uh, but it, you would understand that putting this note with this note in this relation is actually a, a scientific statement, and it does a certain thing. You know, uh, I've done an analysis of melody, of what is melody, and in it, I discussed the fact that, you know, different intervals have different effects uh biologically on us they they actually can be shown to do so so melody is something and and uh you know i use the me in in here i think i used the melody yesterday to discuss that uh in one of my books i do anyway and i analyze the 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 melody of yesterday to show show just how brilliant it is and how it's a definite statement and it tells a story every melody on its own tells a story beyond the lyrics but, but, you know, the major sixth has this romantic thing for a reason. It's not just an accident, you know. So, so those are all very interesting subjects of discussion. And, um, as you mentioned um, uh, yesterday, um, uh, where, uh, where do your thoughts lie uh, as to whether or not um, the four expressions of the, the first melody, it's, it seems to me that it's a little bit ambiguous. Um, uh, everybody sings it. Um, um, yeah, yes, no, no, yes, 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 yes. Um, I can't remember what key's in, and um, uh, it, it's a whole tone, but not the first expression is not. It's not quite a whole tone. It's um, well, well, it is. It depends on what you think note he's singing it, but in general, it is the melody as conceived by him. He may have on that day sung it a little flatter a little but it is it is yes yesterday it's a whole tone and notice it the whole construction of it i'm not going to get into it now but ba -da -da, then he thinks of a way to connect it but i believe in yesterday now yeah. there it's changes it goes up da, yeah. da, da. and that is a brilliant statement it's just like we'd say well you know I'd like cheesecake and I'd like a, a glass of milk, but afterwards, I'd like a double brandy. Yeah, Th that's yeah. the that that last going up is just a way of saying something a little different. Here's another thing that we could add to. So that that's that's all part of it. Yes, but the third time he sings it, he, he doesn't sing a whole tone. He sings a major third. Mm -hmm. Yes, he does. And that's a change. That's the whole point. It's not a whole, it doesn't have to be a whole tone. Who cares? It's a change. It's the change that's important, not, not that's the what, point. That's a, that's a, so my point being is these things, uh, you know, go from one point in time 
whether or not you go with the Kantian idea that you're, you're imposing that time uh, upon it by, uh, you know, some kind of feedback loop. But the point being is this, the, this is not about accuracy. This is about allowing me, the listener, uh, yeah. an interested listener, to feel something about it. In philosophy, it's called qualia. Qualia, what, what is it like to, you know, in, in philosophy of mind, for instance, there's the Mary Mary's room. Mary knows everything. She's read everything. She lives in a monochrome room, but she knows she's she knows everything. She's written everything down and read everything there is to know about colour, but she's never experienced colour. And then when she yeah. leaves, she sees the colour red. And, and so additive to the knowledge that she had, which was very extensive, uh, about describing red and the, where it is in the spectrum and so on and so forth, uh, is the, there's this thing called qualia, uh, which is the experience of the the color red. What's it like to to see red? Now, uh, for for me, music for the listener, I'm not going to legislate on their behalf what it's like to hear me play or not. Yes. I, I, I will not legislate on their behalf. What I do is legislate on my behalf probably by by considering context but also probing as the you know the 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 pilots from the you know Chuck Yeager and so forth uh, probing the edge of the envelope because what's the point in living if you're not going to go up to a boundary and then cross it i mean it's a way to live and um so when people ask me how are you peter i've given a a, a very i think probably annoying and trite answer uh, and it's it's modal, of course, but it's uh, how are you? And I go, it's a way of being, by which I mean, um, I'm I can't be assured about how it is for you, um, even if I express that I'm fine, which is of course um, uh, quite an anodyne. Sure. Anyway. Well, Peter, I'm going to say this to you, and that is, it's totally nothing but fun to talk to you. The second thing I'm going to say is I would love to talk to you again uh, because I have so many more things to talk to you about. Even though I'm a weirdo, I think you're really interesting. So (laughs) therefore, I would I would very much love to talk to you at another time and keep going with this because this is this is fascinating stuff. And and, uh, I love the fact that you've taken the time to, to talk to us about it. And we have so much more to talk about. I just want to, if if you can include this, there's a beautiful moment uh, when Weather Report, I think it's from 1976, uh, they're playing uh, a remark you made. Ah, yes. Uh, And there's a great moment where Joe Zavano plays a substitution that he obviously hasn't played before. And Marco's playing, uh, and you see the the look of, uh, uh, you know, identifying and the pleasure and the love. And it's that part that goes... uh, I don't know if you can hear that, Richard. Yes, yes. That substance. Ah. That's me. Um, But it's that moment in, um, uh, and I would, I would beg your viewers to to watch just that moment, that golden moment, and it's and it's the most portentous thing, because it it means that there's a communication. I believe roughly at the speed of light, but obviously it's sound. Yes. But it, but Jackal was pre was ready. Yes. Was already there, accepting of that and and loving that. And that's the that's the position that you've presented uh, me on many occasions, and I hope I've presented um, to some of the listeners of of any absolutely, of absolutely. Radio Radio Richard, Radio Richard.